Two years ago, Bob Palmer, president of Genesis Group, picked up a copy of my Magian Gospel at a used book sale at a church. He took it home and placed it on a table with a whole lot of other books that someday he intended to read. Several months ago, driven by an impulse which he did not understand at the time, he was moved to walk over to that table, pick out that particular book and start to read it. Somehow it spoke to him, and he became very interested in it and in the author. And I am Charles C. Wise, Jr., who wrote that book under the name of Carolus Magus, which is simply a reasonable Latin equivalent of my name. He finally figured out how to get a hold of the correct named author and uh, gave me a ring and expressed his interest in my work. He and Frank Dickey have asked me to, in my own words, explain the rather curious psychic and spiritual influences which shaped the writing of my books. You may notice that this is being shot in a hospital room. I have heard it said that old age is like being severely punished for a crime that you didn't commit. I, however, am 88 years old. I am certainly in the old age category, but my presence in the hospital is not due to old age. It's due to a blood clot that hit my leg, and uh, I had scheduled meetings with Bob and Frank, and they take place in the hospital instead of in my home. I suppose my books really began with a little poem that I wrote when I was 14 years old. I called it ambition then, but I realized that it was a prayer of purpose for my life. It reads like this. I long to work, to live, to love and learn, find happiness in doing. Where I turn my labor matters little, so that I lift man some fraction nearer to infinity. Let me tell you, don't pray unless you mean it. This has been realized, I hope. But in many years of work and worry and inspiration, as I grew up, I studied law, became a lawyer, and for 40 years served in the federal government as a lawyer and administrator. My work was rather effective and received some recognition, but I have now been retired for 28 years, and my experience is that that retirement is the best job I ever had. And certainly it is when my books were fully completed and most of them written. Before I left Washington in retirement, 
I was teacher at the adult Bible class in Metropolitan Memorial Methodist Church in Washington, D.C., just opposite the campus of American University. The large Presbyterian church, some little distance away, called me one evening and asked me to address their young people. Not knowing any of them, what they would be interested in, I wondered what in the world I could talk with them about. Well, I had been thinking in a somewhat puzzled way about that point in Jesus' life where he was preaching at Capernaum to the folks there in a the home, and his mother and his brothers came and sought to take him home. She thought that he was beside himself, which really means that he was schizophrenic. Now, every Jew present, and they were all Jews, thought that he would surely stop his preaching, go to the door, bring his mother in, get her comfortably seated before he said another word. Didn't the fifth commandment require it? David, I mean, Jesus used this as an opportunity. Instead of going to the door, instead of even encouraging her admission, he stated to the group, those who do the will of my Father in heaven, they are my mother and my brother and my sisters. This was a shock. I thought of that incident, and I could see what Jesus was doing. Like an Old Testament prophet, he was making an extraordinary demonstration of the fact that doing the will of God is more important than obeying the Ten Commandments. I, I could see what he was doing, but the thought came over me, how did his mother feel at that time? And I may have asked it aloud, even though I was riding the bus on my way to work. Immediately, and I cannot explain this, I had full contact with the mind of Mary, his mother, at that very moment of apparent rejection. The anger, the hurt, the worry. You see, it was not only her son, Jesus, that she had to worry about, but there had been rumors of using the word Messiah in connection with Jesus. And if he were to be executed as a potential Messiah, all the male members of his family would similarly be killed to wipe out the bloodline. She had reasons to worry, and the intensity of her emotions came through very clearly. I grabbed out old envelopes from my pocket and wrote rapidly on the back of them. I borrowed a Kleenex from the girl next to me and did more writing. When I reached the office, I went in, spoke to the people, my secretary, went into my office, took any calls that came in, and the contact was not broken. Until just before lunch, I finished the picture window, which is called The Mother at Capernaum. This is a rather remarkable occurrence. 
I did not feel that this was simple inspiration. I felt the actual emotions of a woman. Well, said, well, maybe you're getting to be a great creative writer, Charlie. My short story writer in college, a teacher of short story writing, had said that I lacked the imagination to be a truly creative writer, that he felt I was superb at writing factual accounts and I would do very well as a newspaper reporter or as a lawyer writing legal briefs and uh, matters of that kind. These were not legal briefs. Well, uh, that was that. And it was, it seemed to me, a very powerful piece. The following New Year's, I was waiting. I, I could not fill out my income tax, which I had done every New Year's Day up to that point, because I had not gotten the slip that said how much I had made for the year. So I was thinking about a performance of the seven last words of Jesus on the cross. A French composer had written music to a text that included those words. And the words themselves are magnificent and the music was rather good. But the material in between the words to explain them was the utmost drivel. That I was furious about it. And not able to work on my income tax on that day, I asked aloud, what in the world was really going through Jesus' mind when he said each of those words? And bang, it hit me again. Now please, I cannot explain this to you. I would have difficulty believing it if someone had told it to me as a, at the time I was a hard-nosed lawyer interested in evidence and not. But it has happened to me. I had to accept that. And I was in Jesus' mind as he hung on the cross. And the piece, Seven Sentences from a Cross, has had remarkable acceptance, even in the churches. I was asked to come to Altoona, Pennsylvania, to the joint church service on Good Friday to read that standing under a huge crucifix in the Catholic Cathedral at Altoona. These were the first two of some 32 experiences in which I got personal assistance. After an inquiry as to what really happened, the full story and incidents in the life of Jesus, some person who was there, or the chief person himself. I was either put in touch with their memories at a later period, or in their minds at the actual moment. And there was a, a shift that I could feel, but I can't explain to you exactly how it worked. But I, all I know is that on 32 occasions, I asked the universe for information, for information about particular incidents in the life of Jesus and was put in touch with someone who knew. One of the most interesting and in some ways amusing is when I asked for fuller information about the temptations of Jesus. Well. According to the official account, which presumably came from Jesus, there was no one there but he and the devil. 
How could anybody give me further information? I was visited mentally by the devil, who turned out to be a very polite and uh, rather gratiating person who claims, as is mentioned at the beginning of the book of Job, to be a son of God and uh, one who talked with God in heaven. And I thought that that particular piece, The Temptations of Jesus, in what later became my book, Picture Windows on the Christ, was the most perfectly scripted piece that I had ever written. You will notice that in each of these incidents, I ask the universe for fuller information on something and concentrating on that event, I was given just what I asked for, information about that event. You know, I'd been a lawyer for a good many years, and I had set up a psychic shield that others could not penetrate. They could not read my mind. They could not force ideas into my consciousness. The other side, the other world, whatever it is, was very interested in the fact that I was receiving exciting information from important people of the past, and they had ideas for further writings by me. But they ran into this psychic shield, and they could not get my attention. They ordinarily work by putting ideas into people's heads and letting those people think that it's their ideas. But here was a man that they couldn't poke ideas at unless they could get him to agree to receive them. I think there's a point here, too. I don't believe evil can come into your life unless you somehow open yourself and invite it in. And certainly the stories about Dracula and the other uh, of that ilk suggest they have to be invited in before they can do you harm. Well, the problem with the other side was, how did they get enough of my attention to be invited? And an opportunity came. One very dear to me, whom I had nursed through six months of cancer, terminal cancer, died and was given a memorial service. After the service, which was attended by a good many of our friends, I asked a psychic who was there if Anita had attended the service. He said, yes, I saw her here, but she looked terribly unhappy and distressed. But when you've given, done all the night nursing for six months, that isn't what you want to hear. So I said, oh, these damn psychics, what do they know anyhow? But two days later, I get a call from another psychic friend of mine who lived in Winchester and who uh, was a closet psychic, not proclaimed uh, generally to the public, and who uh, served as a, an analyst of Iron Curtain economies for the CIA. He said, Charlie, you've got to do something. Anita was here this morning just raising hell. She doesn't like the way she's left her will. She wants changes made. I said to her, woman, you're dead. Go on with your business on the other side and please leave these things to be dealt with. And he said, she left me with a howling headache and I think you'd better talk with her and get her quieted down. 
So a dear friend of mine, a Harvard graduate, a graduate of one of the major seminaries in the United States, and a former minister who is my personal friend and perhaps the most respective psychic I've ever known. I was invited to my house to give Anita an opportunity to talk over whatever was worrying her. And the tape machine was set up to record that transmit that uh, reception, whatever it would be. Well, we said a prayer of protection. We invited but did not demand that anyone on the other side who had wished to talk with us would be welcome, provided they came in love. And uh, there was no delay. A group came in who said that they had charge of Anita's adjustment to the next world. And she was really doing very well. There was some confusion. So it went on for about one side of the tape, which must be about an hour. And then another voice came through. Dr. Wise, we did not arrange this session this evening primarily to discuss your lady's affairs. Would you like to know what your next book is to be? Well, I had only been eight or ten days from one of the most fatiguing things in my life. I had made it clear to the other side that I would do no writing and no listening until Anita was safely delivered to the other side. As soon as she was dead, they worked out this system for getting me into a psychic where they could give me a subject for my next book. And it came as a shock. Yes, I would. Say on, counselor. We want you to write the story of Jesus. And I said, what in the hell have I been doing for the last 10 years with my picture windows? How can we say this? to one who has shed tears of joy over the beauty of what he has received. But, sir, in those, the story hides behind the personality of the several narrators. We want you to tell the story now as it actually occurred and in the first person. I don't know what you think. But I was scared. Uh, how can you write the autobiography of somebody unless you have their spirit, unless you have this? Well, they went on to give me great encouragement. They said, that I was a remarkable receiver and that they saw this book from them. Well, I argued a little bit over the windows. I said, look, these, these are pretty good. Should I publish? How am I going to do with these? And uh, they were not much interested in anything that had been done. They were interested in what comes next. But they finally said that perhaps the two could be organized into a single great work which would shed a lot of light on Jesus. Well, you know, you can't easily and convincingly argue with these spiritual forces that come 
through in this manner. I'd argued as much as I could and probably saved the publication of my picture windows because they finally said, publish anything you want, but get on with the new work. <laughs> well, when I was half through the Magian Gospel of Brother Yeshua, I was getting information from what I suppose is Yeshua that was not exactly covered by the Sunday school lessons that I had been had received in my youth. And I said, look, if this is published, I'll probably be assassinated. And certainly in any previous century would be killed by law. So I took six months off and I thought carefully about this process of meditation that was bringing me this information. How valid would the information be? How much could it be relied upon? Was I perhaps under the control of some sinister power in writing this material? I am a person who wants to know and to know the truth. And I was having doubts about the very thing that I was finding such joy in doing. Well, I thought very carefully about this and I came to these conclusions. God cannot speak to man except through the mind of a living man. Therefore, he never speaks unambiguously because every message from God, and I don't care what scripture book you take or what religion you're talking about, is colored by the weaknesses the biases, the lack of education, or many other factors of the individual who is getting the message. And why are these individuals picked? And the answer was clear. God does not speak just to those who are good. God speaks to all who are listening. That is the key. Certainly prayer works, but prayer is somewhat different from what is conventionally understood. God does not answer prayers individually. Get the picture of an old man seated at a desk with a pile of petitionary prayers in front of him and three filed baskets granted, denied, hold. Uh -uh. That is not the way prayer works. The world that God has created has a system whereby the prayer's intensity and desire causes the prayer to be answered. Now, faith does the work. And if the faith is in the wrong end of the machine, that's fine. If it believes in something else, prayers to idols work if they are sincere prayers. Because God has created a world in which a true prayer, 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 and a true prayer consists of two elements, the picture and the passion. And this is where you have to watch out because the system does not distinguish 
between emotions. That which is feared is prayed for as much as that which is desired. Wasn't it Job who said, that which I feared has come upon me? Well, you're darn right it has. Because that is negative praying. And it's dangerous. Well, I also realized that the information coming through to me could just as possibly be as true or truer than the information that came to those who wrote the books of the Bible. Well, somewhat calm, but not entirely comfortable, I went on and finished the amazing gospel of Brother Yeshua. Whew, how to get it published. So I go over to my psychic friend and I say, look, we got to get some help on the other side, how to get this book on the road, you know. So we went. And they came through and they were very pleased that I had finished that book and thought, they said, uh, when I asked for help on how to get it published, they brushed that off and went right ahead with this next statement, Dr. Wise. We thought your book on Jesus would be your last great work. But now we see three more books coming from you. Oh yeah, well what's the first one? We want you to write the autobiography of God. I, uh, I said, and I meant it literally, for God's sake, don't tell me about the other two. This sounded almost blasphemous to me, that any man could undertake to write the autobiography of God. It obvious, it was so obvious that it couldn't be done by anybody, and it certainly I couldn't do it, that I had about the most complete writer's block that you can get. I suppose I really had difficulty letting the guard down. At any rate, I know I thought about that subject, and I got more upset. And one night I was sitting in my chair in the basement, my old red leather chair that had seen me through so many interesting experiences. And I felt a terrific presence enter the room. This was something that you can only conjecture about the amount of force or power involved in it. I knew what it was, but I never ask any of my visitors for definitions as to names, because most of the time they pick the name that they think will give you an idea of who they are rather than make a specific acknowledgement of being an individual. But I finally said, so, you wish me to write an autobiography of you? Yes. Well, nobody can and I certainly can. Well, you can do it better than anyone else. I had an argument with what I think was God that night. And while I had it, I 
set it down in longhand with pencil on pad, and it constitutes the foreword of my book, Thus Saith the Lord, the Autobiography of God. When the book was finished, and by the way, he said that I had done a pretty good job with uh, Jesus' book. <laughs> he indicated he expected it to as well as his. But, <laughs> you know, I, I broke out into a rash. I, sheer nerves, I suspect, but it was one that my, it was similar to one my mother had had when she was. Uh, presumably got it from washing dishes in the water. That wasn't where I got it. Uh, uh, he told me to write the book. What could I do? I said I would. Now you understand that in all these dealings, with the other world. You do have the power to say no. But if you, I felt if I did, I would deny the very essence of my existence. I, mu I felt I had come here to do something rather special. And boy, this was getting very specialized. Well, I didn't know how to begin. You're talking about a writer's block. How, what would you do with an assignment like that? So I go to my psychic friend, and I get to the other side there. I'm open now to this subject. How should I start? Then I got a worse shock. Start with my beginnings. We're talking about God. His beginnings. But I went back and I tried, and I got about four pages done. And I got, I was getting something that scared the hell out of me. Went back to the psyche. Uh, I, I'm having trouble. Well, that's all right. Set that aside and take a, a, another chapter. Rewrite the story of Adam and Eve. You don't think I'm being beat up at this point. Let me tell you, I have a fairly tough mind. I was so recognized at an early age. Not always tough in body, but really tough in mind. And I was feeling like a whipped pup. Well, I went back to it, and suddenly it flowed. It is certainly the most profound theological work that I have written. I hope everybody understands that my writing is not celestial dictation, that no voice is heard. What I have been given most of the time, or have myself given, is a subject. And I concentrating on that subject, information that relates to it can come flooding in. I do not know where the information comes from since I had individual people feeding me in picture windows. I, as, I'm making the assumption, certain assumptions as to who it is, but I have no right to question them. I have to decide whether the information is valid or not. I have to then put it into my own words. 
The reason they don't suggest words to me is because they feel that my many years of practice with words makes me fully able to express any thought that can come into my mind. So the wording is mine. I feel a great sense of wonder whose all the ideas are. I think I know, but I cannot prove. I would find this story very hard to accept before I had the actual experience of having it happen to me. And I cannot deny what factually occurred, but attempt to explain it I will not, because it is far beyond my comprehension. <clears throat> well, the book on God was finished. Did I mention mind is it? No. Which was the result of the six months taken off in uh, the writing of the Magian Gospel. My thoughts I finally put together in mind is it. Meditation, prayer, healing, and the psychic. It is a relatively short book it is very clearly written as a, almost as a textbook, in very succinct and straightforward language with little attempt at poetry, except perhaps at the end where I've included a poem on faith that God so liked that he said that's the kind of faith I needed to do his autobiography. But, uh, Many people have thought that this book, Mind Is It, is the best book that I have written because the others are too esoteric for them and this is a rather straightforward but thought-producing work that I recommend. It, it will speak rather clearly to people who are not into the psychic field directly, although that is rather covered in it. Well, with the biography of, autobiography of God written, what really remained? What possible encore could you do to that? It is interesting that almost all the forces that came through about these various books were from men. And apparently David receives them better than he does the women. But there was a new psychic married into the family of a friend of mine, and she was just getting started with the development of her psychic powers. I went over there one night and she was going to bring little messages through to everybody and all of a sudden Dr. Weiss was given a message that there was something special for him but he would, it would require a private session a little later with the same channel. I got the private session and I was instructed to write a book called The Holy Families. And I said, plural? Yes. It was pointed out that the members of the Holy Families had been raised to the level of gods. They'd been promoted so high that humanity had lost them and that they could no longer serve as guides for ordinary human behavior. 
Mary said that they should all be treated as human beings and could recover their desired influence on the minds and hearts of men. I said, well, who should be included among these? Well, now you go home and do your meditating and you will know which ones that they should be. So I came back later to try to check, make sure I had the right list. And I, of course, had Jesus and the Buddha and uh, uh, Muhammad and others. Well, you've left out one important person. Well, who is that? Go home and it will be made clear to you. You see the wonderful, they're still trying to improve me and open me as a receiver, even at this late date. Well, by the way, the one that I hadn't thought to include did not found a church. It was Socrates and he is really the master for those who believe in reason and has had any influence equal to that of religious leaders in the minds of men since his day. Well, that also brought an interesting problem because the information that came to me almost universally was from the wives of these great men and not from them themselves. But there were two notable exceptions. Joseph came through along with Mary discussing the problems that raising a child like Jesus really gave to a couple of untrained parents. But to my mind, one of the personal joys was to have Xantippe give me the lowdown on Socrates for about 20 pages. And when I felt sure that I needed to give Socrates a chance to comment on it, his opening words were, the first thing I wish to say is that everything Xantippe said is absolutely true. And then he goes on for 20 pages discussing his life without once referring to Xantippe at all until he gets to the last sentence and then he said that they didn't meet very often in the year. <laughs> uh, I, if you love the Greek writers at all, you will know how funny that is. But that is a book that contains the story of Ruth and Naomi because Naomi is really the powerful figure in that story, not Ruth. And the Buddha, the story of the Buddha comes through his wife. A lot of people don't know that he was married, but of course he was, and he had a son before he left his wealth and leadership and went off to try to find enlightenment. And it is a rather beautiful story. Mrs. Wise and I had a son. Charles, well, we had three sons, but the one I'm talking about here is Charles Conrad Wise III, Tertius Terry, for, so he wouldn't be confused with his father. Terry Wise was a remarkable poet. When he was attending Roanoke College at Salem, Virginia, he was struck while riding his motorcycle back to the 
school in Roanoke. I wondered if Terry would get in touch with me. For about three years, no, but that is not unusual. When the young are killed in war or in accidents, they apparently do some resting before they communicate with anybody. About three years after Terry's death, and at approximately the 15th of March, I received a letter from a psychic in Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio, or was it in Cleveland, Ohio? A very fine psychic who said Terry had been there and given her three poems that he wanted her to send to me. Well, I didn't know what to think of that, but I thought. And then seven days later, I get a letter from an opera singer in Michigan, in Michigan or Minnesota, at any rate, an entirely different state. These two ladies had never met. She'd sung her solo in the church choir, and my friend, the minister, was making his sermon, and she was just doodling on a piece of paper when Terry came to her with a poem and said, send it to his father, that he could get the address from the minister. Let it suffice to say, and since that time, I have received somewhat over 30 poems from Terry from the other side through six different people widely scattered over the eastern part of the United States and utterly unknown to each other. And some of them have unmistakable bits of information that only Terry could have known the significance of. I know of no such body of information anywhere in the world that seems as convincing as this group of poems. And I put the first the few of these into a supplement to be inserted in Terry's book when it goes out, and I left some of those on the table for you. There are two more books I must mention. I have written and am giving to the offices of Genesis my personal reminiscences. After all, if I have written the autobiography of Jesus and the autobiography of God, it is reasonable that they told me that the final book in my group as of that time would be my own autobiography. And because I have been tossed about by a playful God, it seemed to me, I decided to call my own work The Laughter of God, Reminiscences of an Unconventional Mystic. I also want to say a word about a book which was published by a publisher last December and which is called Beyond Love. At a final taping, I asked the other side if my work were finished and they, or was there another work for me to do? And they said, yes, there was a work that needed to be done. To trace how the emotions have shaped the development of civilization from primitive man all the way up to the present and into the next century, the future, and what the results were going to be. This, I feel, is not so much factually influenced by the other side 
as an effort to make me as an old administrator accustomed to projecting present trends into a foreseeable future lay out the problem of overpopulation that no politician is touching with a 10-foot pole and to counteract the concept that growth is the solution of all economic problems, which seems to be the idea of both business and government at the present time. My wife hates that book. She is angry that I asked her to type it. Of course, she did type it. She's one of the great secretaries the real secretaries that could do it all, you know, and was of great help to me in many of my books. But they said the book was needed. It is not a kind book. I certainly wish good luck in taking over the job of making my work known to the world. I have labored diligently for over 40 years to create this material. I believe that God and his assistants and angels and messengers meant it to be known. At 88, I sort of feel that if I did the writing and paid for the initial publications and did everything else, always, as they insisted, putting the books first and never letting anybody, even those I loved, limit my attention to that work. But I have done the best I can. Good luck, and God bless you and me.